Um, so I'm going to start by saying I have really bad social anxiety. So if my brain has a bit of a stack overflow error and I pause, please bear with me. Um, I, I'm also feeling slightly intimidated today as I listen to a lot of the presentations because I realize it's been like 20 years since I wrote a line of code. So this is very much a conversation from a business perspective. I'm not trying to tell you guys how to do your job because you know how to do it better than I do. Um, so I, I guess what I would like to do is take, and I have some notes, but I haven't produced slides, um, is take you through kind of a, an overview of how banks operate the process and the data that kind of underpins banking, and then what are the opportunities for the open source community to get involved in disrupting it. And, and just, I would caveat that by saying I would like to help with that disruption because I actually think the banking industry won't do it on its own. Uh, and it is really ripe for opportunities to change the way things are done and to democratize not just the data but also financial services more broadly. Um, so I started my career as a programmer. Um, sadly, it, it was in things like Ada and Lisp and you know RPG. So most people don't know what I'm talking about when I say those things. Um, but it was it was a time when everybody you met knew how to do the same thing. Whereas as I walk around the conference and talk to people today, it seems like almost everybody is specializing in something different, um, which I kind of find a bit mind boggling. Um, but I took that career and I went through lots of different industries. I started in government, I moved into technology companies, then moved into media and finally finance. Um, probably around my 30s, I started being the annoying technologist in the room who always asked why. So when I worked for a tech company, it made perfect sense. Tech for the sake of tech is you know, what you do to learn, to evolve, to experiment. When you work for a bank or a broadcaster, it really doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, I, I cringe every time I hear a CEO say, we're a technology company. Because if you've ever worked in a bank and seen how shockingly bad the tech is, <laughs> you kind of think, why aren't you out of business? Um, so I, I guess the point is, is that you need to kind of, I guess, challenge if you're in banking, why you're doing some of the things that you're doing. And I think if you're not in banking, it's worth understanding the landscape that the banks have to deal with. So again, it's not uncommon in banking to find yourself in a situation, sorry, wrong button, um, <laughs> where you wind up in a data center and you find a COBOL program that's quite happily humming along in the corner somewhere, doing the same thing it was written to do 40 years ago with no problems today. The problems stem from the fact that somebody wanted to add a feature to that program, and the person who wanted to add a feature to that program didn't know how to write COBOL. So they write an application that takes the data and manipulates that and tweaks the platform and modifies it to do different things. And as that builds up over literally decades, you wind up with this complicated web of middleware and integration and applications modifying and changing data between them to the point that it becomes very hard to audit. And I'll give you a very real world example that I had in my first job in banking um, when I moved from broadcasting to financial services. And I inherited a system that was made by a very large global technology company that was an accounting platform. It was very good at what it was done, but it was written in the 80s. And the bank had expanded out of the UK into other markets. So they needed a way to track currency transactions in other markets. They had to do currency accounting. So the technologists didn't know what to do. So they took this 1980s mainframe accounting program and they adapted it to do currency accounting. And at its basic level, currency accounting is no more than saying, here's my home currency, it's pound sterling for argument's sake, I have these transactions in euros, US dollars, Japanese yen, whatever it is. But again, the program was written in the 1980s. It didn't have a currency flag. So how do you track which transactions are in which currency? And the developer thought, oh, I've got a field here we're not using. So we'll just put a currency flag in that field. But then that means the accountants then had to extract anything that had something in that field from their run when they produced the accounts. When you tried to produce a statement for a client that had accounts in a different jurisdiction, you had to extract the data and then filter it down on those currency accounts. And it became more and more convoluted over time, so much so that this big technology company who had to update the software regularly in order to comply with the international accounting standards would take an extra three to six months to produce the update for us. Because again, once they'd done it for everybody else, they took a look at our systems and the end-to-end -end testing and had to not break things in the chain. So we were always out of compliance 
with accounting standards for a good three to six months after they came into play. So that level of complexity actually is one system and not even a banking system that we had in that bank. So if you take a regional bank, something that operates in the UK, France, US, which is a huge market, each state usually has a slightly different banking system, um, and you multiply it by 10 for core banking systems, mortgage platforms, payment platforms, very quickly you can see how the level of complexity can become unwieldy, right? And trying to transform that base layer can be problematic. If you go to a big global bank, which I have worked in a couple, you can multiply that complexity by a thousand. And I'm not kidding. One of the banks I worked for, I had over a thousand apps. And when you looked at which apps actually were unique, it was about 50. So you had multiple instances of things, you had tweaks, you had forking of code, all sorts of problems. So again, why do you care? <laughs> because fundamentally, if you listen to Bruce earlier in his plenary, right, open source has won the battle. Fair enough, right? All the big technology companies underpin their software on open source. Well, not all of them, but most of them, right? And it's no different in banking. But as you heard Bruce said, and I've heard it said in my 20 years in financial services, somebody needs a, no a neck to choke, right? Banks are hugely risk averse, they're highly regulated, and so they don't want to just literally go to GitHub, pull something in and deploy it. Because when something goes wrong, they need to know that they can point the finger at somebody and they're going to fix it. And it's, I've seen it happen time and time again, and I'm not gonna name any names, but if you've read the news in the last 12 months, you've seen several issues with <coughs> banking IT systems, and they're always trying to put the blame onto a deployment or somebody's code change. It's never them. Now, it's not that they're trying to dodge responsibility, but again, they have so many other responsibilities that it becomes problematic and they're not technologists, right? The best technologists don't generally work in banking. So you have this sort of problem that goes back and forth, and I don't think that we can solve it, but what we can actually look to solve is the data question. So again, if you look at the data that banks have, and actually I meant to say, sorry, at the start, I'm, I did tell you I was nervous, didn't I? <laughs> I would like this to be more of a conversation, so I'm up here just literally spewing at you if you want me to stop, if you want to ask a question, please just raise your hand and do so. Or if I've used an acronym or jargon and you're thinking I have no idea what it is, please do stop me. Um, I'm sure the man doesn't want to hop up and down with the microphone, but it would probably help me as well as you um, to avoid monologuing. So <laughs> if you look at all that technical complexity and you look at all the operational complexity as well, there's all the business processes that go behind that that require data to operate. So client onboarding, right? We all have bank accounts, I'm assuming. You're not just keeping money, cash under your mattress. So therefore, you've had to go to a bank, you've had to produce proof of address, proof of identity. They probably want to know where your money is coming from because they have to make sure, because the regulators want them to, that you're not getting that money from some sort of criminal activity. Likewise, when you want to pay your registration fee for this conference, they have to scan that transaction to make sure that you are not trying to launder money for somebody. So there are all these sort of processes that are wrapped around it. And the data breaks down into sort of two key groups. There's private data, which is the data that they hold on their customers. So again, even though you provide your passport or your driver's license to a bank to open an account, how they store that data is different because it's unique to their systems, many of which are built on a core banking platform that could be 20, 30, 40 years old. So it's not easily shareable, right? Same thing with your products and your accounts, your current account, your mortgage, your credit card, everybody's products are a little bit different and the systems underpinning them are a little bit different. But there's also a huge array of public data that people don't think about. And ironically, none of this data currently, at least in my experience, really truly sits in an open source type of form today. It's still controlled by commercial companies, even though it doesn't have to be. So if we look at things like how I route money to you, right? You've decided to sell me something, I want to send you some cash. The routing codes for that transaction are public data. They're issued by the Bank of England, or they're issued by the Financial Conduct Authority, or they're issued by the Fed, or the OCC, or whoever it is, right? That data can be pulled down and used, right? There's nothing to stop you, again, as long as it's theoretically not for commercial gain initially, from making that data available as an open source data set. And that applies to all sorts of stuff. Let's look at credit data as a good example. So we all, probably unknowingly, but willingly, 
allow our banks to submit data on our payments, our credit limits, things like that. That data is not actually public, or sorry, private data in one sense, because the banks are providing, you know, yep, Lee has made his payment on time every month for the last 12 months. Yes, Lee has, you know, a 500 quick credit limit on his credit card. <laughs> they won't give me more than that because I work in banking. Um, and, and so as a consequence, we're giving that all to commercial companies who are monetizing it. And in every jurisdiction, and I've worked in about 70, literally, it's some of the big global banks that I've seen over the years, it's always controlled by one or two key companies. But it's your data, right? Why? Why is it being sold to company X for them to commercialize on our behalf? Particularly when you look at the fact that those credit scoring agencies routinely screw things up. Why? Because again, they're ingesting data from multiple banks and multiple formats with different flags and different problems with capitalization and all sorts of stuff, and they make mistakes. Humans make mistakes, right? So they're trying to ingest data, they're trying to codify it, they're trying to concatenate it, and when they do make a mistake and it affects you, what's your redress? I mean, literally, right? Have you ever managed to, is anybody here, I'm curious actually, managed to successfully fight a credit score when you were applying for a loan or a credit card or something? Literally, anybody? because I haven't been able to, and I've worked in banking for 20 years. I've literally had my own bank saying, no, we won't loan you a mortgage. And I'm like, are you kidding me? You know how much I make. You know what I do. Why would you not give me the mortgage? I had to go to a different bank. I mean, it's insane. So again, I think there are areas like this where, as a community, we could actually, and it, don't get me wrong, it's like what Bruce was saying earlier. This is not something that we can do tomorrow or next month or even next year. But I think there's an opportunity there to start defining data sets. Market data is another good one. There's a small number of companies that have a stranglehold on market data, but that data, again, is public data. It's pulled down from stock exchanges. It's pulled down from company registers. Why wouldn't we look as a community to create a framework for an open data standard for financial services to help define field formats and flags and things like that, and then start actually collaboratively building a translation catalog that everybody could use. One of the things I do in my spare time since I left my last bank is I am the independent chair for the Bank of England Strategic Transformation Board. So this board has been set up three years ago now by the Bank of England, the Financial Conduct Authority, to change the way they regulate financial services, right? They want to move away from post-mortem reporting so, oh, here's the mortgage report from six months ago that tells you how many people didn't pay their mortgage on time that month. Two, what's happening today? What's happening in the financial system today? How does that correlate to things like the new unemployment figures or the credit defaults or the market movements? And how could we then understand that and take proactive action to avoid the big dips and swings and troughs in the economy? It's actually, uh, the reason I do this job with them is because I actually think it has a huge potential to impact financial services and everybody and actually stop the ridiculous interest rate swings, for argument's sake, that we've been seeing globally. Um, but again, we're looking at this and we're trying to think, how? How do we get the data from 500 financial services institutions in the UK? Because it's not just the big banks you might know, it's people who do like sort of unsecured lending. It's car lease providers, it's commercial real estate providers. There are literally hundreds of financial services companies well beyond banking. And so again, looking at this idea of how can we take this data and how can we figure out how to create a common view of it is crucial. And right now the bank is trying to look at the data standards committee and where they can go to try and use some sort of existing standard, but the problem is there really aren't many. There's some for niche industries, but there isn't one for financial services. So again, when I was talking to Amanda Brock a couple of months ago at a different conference, I was making this point that I think, you know, somebody not in the regulators and not in the financial services institutes needs to kind of come forward and actually try to help us objectively set up a standard and help us start collecting some of this data in such a way that everybody could leverage it. Because if we could do that, then that gives all the open source developers out there an opportunity to use that data to build code, which could go to start replacing some of those key components in those banks in the future. Because you'll be able to actually work with real life data, not try to create synthetic data that you might get right or you might not if you don't understand financial services. I think it also has the potential 
to start truly democratizing financial services. So my title pitch for Armando is like open data versus open banking. So the complexity that we see in banking makes it really hard for banks to introduce new products, but it also makes it really hard for all of us to move our accounts, right? Because there's so many things you have to unpick and re-onboard with the new bank, change your direct debits, your standing orders. The banks have processes they put in place under open banking to make that transition easier here in the UK, but like they don't have quite the same thing in some of the other jurisdictions and they're flawed. They don't always work for one reason or another. So you wind up maintaining two sets of accounts for a while while you try to make sure that you don't miss a payment on something or you don't get an incoming credit from something. So the whole open banking initiative, the idea behind it really was to try to open up the banks a bit, right? Allow other parties to come and offer financial services to us, but leveraging the bank. But the problem is, is that it kind of didn't take account of two things, right? The first is that at the end of the day, none of us really have much in the way of actual cash, right? Everything's dematerialized. It's an accounting entry on somebody's computer in some bank somewhere. But that bank has physical assets with the central banks. So somebody still has to have that underlying physical asset that underpins your life. So that kind of makes it hard if you're a fintech or a startup because the only way that you can actually truly do a transaction for a client is if you can get your hands on that cash. And obviously what the banks don't want to do is give you the cash because then they lose their capital and that impacts their other business areas. The, the second thing I think people didn't think about was that who wants to be disintermediated from a customer, right? Like everybody in this room has probably seen what has happened in the US, in Japan, in Europe, in the UK with the decentralization of the telecommunications industry or the decentralization of the energy systems, right? Separating the grid from the producers, from the people who sell you the power, separating the unbundling of your local loop from the infrastructure that provides the mobile connections and the lease line connections. It's wound up pushing big companies who used to be incredibly successful and actually innovative into a situation where they provide a commodity service and they don't make the value out of money in the same way. And that's what banks are afraid of. If you disintermediate a bank by sticking an app at the front of all your accounting stuff, then how do you maintain that relationship with the customer? That's why like when I, I've left my phone over there so I wouldn't fidget, but like I can pull my phone out and I can look at my wallet on my phone and I can see my credit card transactions. Not just the ones I tapped with my phone, but also whatever's currently on there. I have opted in to allow my wallet to pull that data from my bank, right? But I can't ask for a credit limit increase. I can't transfer a balance from one card to another. I can't even open another card, unless of course it's an Apple card in the States. But even then I can't because they're closing it down. So again, we haven't really seen that level of disruption. And I was interestingly talking to a woman last night at the speaker's dinner um, who's doing a presentation tomorrow from one of the big banks here in the UK. And we were talking about this challenge that, you know, even with the APIs that her and her team are building, that bank really doesn't want me to hire a bunch of techs and build an app that would allow me to create a front end to all of your bank accounts because then you're disintermediated. So, Again, I think the challenge is, is that the more we try to push on these levers, the more resistance the banks get, right? So if you can put yourself in the bank's shoes, right? You've all heard that phrase, walk a mile in someone else's shoes. I'd, I'd say you need to put yourself in two shoes, right? The first is the bank. They're risk averse, they're highly regulated. When they mess something up, it has catastrophic impacts on people's lives. And that makes the regulators come down harder on them again, right? There, there have been a bunch of fines recently reported both in the US and the UK on banks recently. So again, this is one of the reasons why they are change resistant. I think the second thing is put yourself in your own shoes for a second, right? So I'm sure most of you quite happily give your data to Google when you're using Google Maps to navigate. I don't, I hate Google. No offense if Google's here, sorry. Um, <laughs> but I don't need somebody tracking all my whereabouts. I'm not that interested, right? I believe it or not, still have an old printed A to Z that I use when I really can't find where I'm going. And, and actually, neurologists would tell you that's a better way to do it because if you're staring at your phone and they're letting your phone navigate you to your location, you stop using your 3D relationships in your brain and it actually atrophies those nerve connections, right? Slight tangent, sorry. Um, but again, my point to you is, is that the banks are in a similar boat. They want to know what we're doing, they want to know what we're spending our money on, 
are you willing to actually give them the data? Are you willing to give the data that you might unwillingly give now, your credit data, to somebody else? And I think if your answer to any of these questions is yes, what's your personal risk appetite? Are you willing to let somebody know? You, randomly, sir, right there in the third row with the beard. <laughs> I'm going to pick on somebody since nobody's asking me questions. So like, are you willing to, to for argument's sake, share your payment data with us? Yeah. Not, but not literally, like, you know, I mean, and again, but see, you're, you're squirming, and I'm sorry, I shouldn't have done that, because I have social anxiety and I should respect your boundaries. Um, but my point, that is my point, right? Like, if, if we're not willing, personally, to allow people to see our transaction history, to allow people to see our payment history, to allow people to know where we have our main bank account versus our pension account versus our investment account, then what hope do we ever have of trying to crack the nut? right, and, and truly disrupt financial services. I honestly think that, you know, right now, banks outsource so much to technology providers, to service providers for call centers. I mean, I've been trying to get through to my bank to get my tax form fixed for the last two weeks because they blocked one of my accounts. It's driving me nuts. And it's being handed off to a third-party call center for processing all the time. So our data is being shared anyways, right? And again, I think if you think about it like that, what benefit do you get back and what are you willing to give in exchange? And that's the key. I think the opportunity is there for us. I mean, I, I, again, I could talk up here for an hour and I'm feeling like I might be losing you guys. So I won't. <laughs> and I know coffee break is coming up in 10 minutes. Um, but I think there is a huge opportunity there to build that framework, right? Even a framework that banks could then look at and think, you know what? Let's start submitting the data to the regulators in this format so that it simplifies the regulator's job. If we made that hurdle even, then it becomes a much easier step to say, OK, so if you're willing to share that data with the regulators, are you willing to share that data with an open data provider who actually would allow you then, as a bank, to be able to pull data that you don't hold in and use it for your own processes? It's, it's really not that far-fetched. But I think what it needs is a community who aren't bankers but who are data specialists and technologists to try to come together to put some shape around it and to give some comfort to the banks that actually people who know what they're talking about do it. Because when you're in the bank and you're trying to do this stuff, and I've been that lone voice in the wilderness, it's like the Jesus effect, right? You're in your own town and nobody wants to listen. You go somewhere else and everybody wants to listen. So it kind of needs something like the open source community behind it, in my opinion, or something like Open UK. Obviously, you know, if it was backed by people like Microsoft or Google or whoever the big cloud providers are, that would be fantastic as well. But the starting point has to be what's the framework, right? And what's the value add for the banks? And what's the value add for us? And what's the value add for the army of startups and founders that are out there, a couple of whom talked to me already today, to try and disrupt financial services? And then you all should be asking yourselves, what would I be willing to give up? If I can give my travel data to Google, and I'm happy to do it, if I'm happy to put my reviews into TripAdvisor, or whatever it is, you know, why are you not happy to give a piece of data away that might bring you benefit? I'm gonna stop monologuing, because I would like to give somebody a chance to ask me a question. <laughs> Anybody? Oh, thank God. <laughs> I don't know why I let Amanda talk me into doing this. <laughs> Yeah, well, firstly, as a layperson, I thought it was fascinating. So you can put your social anxiety to, to one side for now. Thank it was you. Amazing. Um, I, I feel wish like drinks were right after this. I, have to say. <laughs> um, I don't know if you did it intentionally. You're talking about disrupting, and then didn't mention cryptocurrency. Um, I thought I might get a vague response like that, but I thought I would ask anyway. And what, what role you thought that may or may not have in the discussion we've just kind of kind of So happened. at the risk of sounding like an old fart, right? <laughs> um, and I guess I am an old fart. Um, I've been in banking now for over 20 years. So I remember when I first got into banking I, and I was running payments for a bank, which I'd never done before. I had no clue what the hell I was doing. Everybody telling me that PayPal was going to make my job obsolete, right? Nobody's going to use banks anymore for payments. We're all going to use PayPal. PayPal's getting a banking license, da, 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 da. Still hasn't happened. Right? Probably shouldn't have named the company, but anyways. Um, I, I think cryptocurrency is not dissimilar. Right? When you actually look at it, it is literally a technical solution that is looking for an actual real-world problem. 
And that real world problem just doesn't freaking exist. So if people want to speculate on it, I'm totally okay with that. When I was in college, I used my student loan to speculate on warrants in the 80s, and I made a shed load of money before the big collapse happened, and I lost everything, including my student loan, so I'm very risk averse now. Um, <laughs> but my point is, is like people have speculated on everything, right? People were betting on the rugby last weekend. I mean, I was trying very hard to, to not think Ireland was going to tank, and thankfully we didn't. We just decimated them, but um, you know, I was unwilling to bet on it. But people will speculate on anything. So again, I don't see what problem, as a person in financial services who admittedly is not a banker or an economist or anything else, cryptocurrency solves for me. I just don't, right? I still have to keep a physical asset somewhere with a central bank. If that physical asset at some point, the bank allows it to be a line of code because the bank thinks it has value, okay, fine. But like, actually, it's still not gonna change the fact I have to have gold bars somewhere. Right? I have to have property somewhere. When I worked at one very large bank, we had a vault under the Thames. Uh, when I took over a particular team that ran the gold, I, like, I begged people to let me go down and look at it. I've got, I want a selfie lying on the pallet, but I wasn't allowed to take it. But it's just staggering, right? That it is still like that. I don't know if that answers the question or not. Thank you. Sorry, there was a, the man with the hat there at the back. I desperately need another question. <laughs> Hi. Oh. Yeah, firstly, I just want to say great talk. Um, I wanted to just like ask specifically, because you talked about how the banks, they don't want like a front end for, to, for us to access our banking information, but or, like, so that we can apply for like other things as well. But a lot of it kind of already exists in terms of like that meerkat compared to market kind of thing where you can like take a list of banks and everything. So why, why, why is that like allowed to flourish whereas banks are so hesitant to give their data <clears throat> like to have it in like the open banking mm. format, but they allow it to be on like websites. I know they get a cutback, but surely that could also be implemented in the open banking format. So it's a great question. And I think a different way to look at it is what do you get? What do you get out of comparethemarket.com? Really what you're getting is a list of products and services. So from a bank perspective, it's just another sales channel and it's free. Why wouldn't you put it out there, right? But that's not the quite, excuse me, that's not the quite the same thing as saying, actually, I'm going to allow you to go on to some comparison site, accessing your current account, which shows your overdraft, your fees, and your interest that you pay and receive on that account, and let somebody else compare it to other products in the market so that you can switch because I might lose you as a customer and I don't want to lose you as a customer. So I, I think there's always that tipping point, right, between what is about the customer product and what is about the customer in terms of the relationship. So back in the, in the sort of late 90s, early noughties, when actually it would have been early noughties, all the banks had this idea that because it's so hard to move, once somebody opens a bank some, account somewhere, they're unlikely to ever move it. Right? Not unless you do something like you get a mortgage and the mortgage provider insists you move your current account to them or your checking account if you're American. Um, and so they open children's bank accounts. Right? I I've somewhere got like a National Irish Bank piggy bank that was like, I didn't have a kid at the time, but they were giving these away and I was doing a project with National Irish Bank and I just got the piggy bank because I thought it was funny. It became the swear pig in the office because I have a terrible tendency to swear. Um, and Again, the idea was if we capture the client at three, we will have them till they're 90, right? And it's the way they've always thought of it. But equally, they don't necessarily want to sell you certain products, right? So again, one bank I worked for had 13 different legal entities in it, all within the one country, and they had different brands. So you might get rejected for a mortgage from 12 of those brands, but the 13th one's whole reason to exist was to create a custom mortgage for you. So that way they could get as many mortgages as possible. Sadly, that bank doesn't exist anymore thanks to you know, the way they ran it and the financial collapse. But that point is, is that you know, there's that risk appetite and the banks are always challenging that. They might be happy to loan you a car, money for a car, but not for a mortgage. Or the other way around, because they could repossess the house, but what the hell are they gonna do with the secondhand fiesta, right? So it's, it's always that balancing act. What do you do to allow your clients or other banks' clients to see the products that you have that might be of useful to them and even do calculations and pivots on it versus, mm, I don't want to give that data away because I might lose the customer. Does that make sense? Yeah. Well, just to follow on that, so wouldn't that force banks to innovate? Because if you've got a risk of losing your customer, then should you be competing with other banks rather than just trying to hold on to the customers you've got? 
So that's an excellent. You, it's an excellent question, and my. My view on that is, yes, you would think so. <laughs> Again, when I was in corporate retail banking, our way of innovating in that context was to white label our banks to startups, right? Now, I, I'm not going to get, I'm happy to talk about names when I'm not being recorded if you want to talk over a coffee, but it wasn't really innovation, was it? I mean, you reskin the website, but other than that, like it was basically allowing somebody else to sell to a customer, somebody you probably didn't have as a customer anyways, but it was still winding up on my balance sheet, right? And I think banks do try to, to innovate, and I can think, I have, I have relationships with four different banks in the UK. I mean, honestly, don't get me started on why I have to do that, right? But like nobody likes my profile for certain products in certain banks. And within that context, I think, they have been innovative in the products they have sold me. But universally, they're all going after their own market segments or their own niches. And so they will, right? I think I've got better integration with one of my banking providers now with a third-party app that I like to use. But actually, again, I'm not seeing everything I would like to see in there. I mean, if it were me, my 22-year-old son's a computer engineer, right? I'd love to get him and some of his friends to build an app that would use the open banking framework to just scarf all the APIs and give me one view of my bank accounts in the UK. It would be fabulous, right? Pension, mortgage, current account, NISA. But it's just never gonna happen because they're not gonna put that much data into the API to make it useful for me. I just see probably sort codes and account numbers and maybe a balance if I'm lucky. It's one minute past, oh sorry, there you go. One more. Uh, one, uh, yeah, just wanted to comment on the There are a number of, or at least one credit market that I know, they use the um, uh, credit file in order to get the right product for you. Mm. When you're in the market for credit for you. And that is not based on advertising, for example, because it's truly understanding you know, your uh, uh, lending power, and using it uh, over matching to understand the behavior, because what matters for the lending Um, which is, in my view, that's quite disruptive. I know for sure Play Score does that. It's fine, right? But one thing that I would like to add here is that what kind of like open data that we're talking about here, because in my view, open banking data is quite open already, and it's been developed quite uh, aggressively. So then you have lots of different features in that API within that open data. But it's not open data. It's still sitting in the bank. That's kind of the point, right? So there is a subset of that data that anybody who wants to build financial products needs to operate. And I think that data is locked up in banks. It's locked up in credit agencies. It's locked up in market data providers. And a lot of that data can be created or augmented without having to go through those people. And that's where I think the value comes in. I think if we, if we could do that, right, the banks would actually probably be quite interested in playing with that. So one of the things I did in my last role, which was in an investment bank, was look at what they call corporate access data, right? So these are Apple doing their annual report or road shows to see manufacturing things. This company just scarfs all that data from all the banks who run these events. And what we realized was, why are we giving them our data and then paying to get it back? And so I worked together with a couple of other banks and we looked at putting this into effectively an open source type of provider. So we all put it in, we all got free access to it back, the clients were happier, and actually we saw an uptick in clients buying a service from us because there were clients who didn't know we did it or they didn't know we did it in a particular area. So I, I, again, I think that was me, like the lone voice in the wilderness with two or three other people trying to club together, literally to cut costs, right? But the end result was it was driving revenue. And again, I think that's what informed some of my thinking is that I've seen it and I've made it happen. And if we can do it on a bigger scale, we can be more disruptive. I know I've got to stop. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Lee, for a fascinating talk. <laughs>